Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Doctors of Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, discuss the art and the science of the stuff that we're putting on our feet. I'm Andrea Myers, and today I've got Megan Flynn with us for another special episode. Um, welcome, Megan. Thanks for joining again. Thank you, Andrea. My pleasure. Megan's got a lot of great life and running updates for us, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, today we're doing a this or that episode where we answer your questions, um, comparing two options. So we're really excited about this format and we've got some great questions for you all. So, um, hang tight and we'll get to the questions. But first, Megan, I, I think the last episode you and I recorded together was last year. So tell everybody what you've been up to, um, (laughs) Last time we talked, you were coming back from an injury, so how is that going? How's training? And tell us a little bit about your triathlon accomplishments, too. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. so yeah, it's been a while since I've been on the podcast. I'm looking forward to like getting back into it. Um, So let's see. I had been kind of sidelined, like I hadn't been running for a while for probably, it was probably close to a year with an SI joint issue. I finally figured all that out. Thank God, knock on wood, everything's going well now. Um, but I ended up getting very into like biking and swimming, like we discussed on, I think we talked about it on the previous podcast yeah. that I was in. Um, but now I've been able to get back into running and some training, um, signed up for the Philly Marathon, um, nice. which is coming up in eight weeks from yesterday. Um, I had my first 20 miler yesterday, so I'd say things are going pretty well. Awesome. Um, but that being said, so going like a little bit back into like um, all the cross training and everything through injury, I ended up getting very into biking, as, as you know. <laughs> um, I usually ask Andrea as my go to for uh, any questions for biking. Um, but so I ended up uh, signing up for a couple more triathlons. I did one back in July that ended up going pretty well. It was my first harder run um, since CIM of 2022 of last year. Um, and it went pretty well. It was kind of my test. Let's see how everything feels during this and see if we can start getting back into running. Felt good. We did another um, triathlon in the Pine Barrens on September 9th. Um, which went very, very well. It was actually the first one that I did that I actually felt like I had like trained for running wise. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course the run. So the run on that course is just like a side note. The run on that course is actually through like a soft sand trail. So like getting off the bike, usually I'm like, all right, we got the run now. Like I'm finally like ready for the run. And I turn into the trail. I was like, oh my gosh, like this is (laughs) not ideal. But (laughs) Uh, It ended up going really well. Um, It's the first time I got onto like the overall podium, which was pretty exciting. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, Thank you. But since then, so that was September 9th, um, I've been really transitioning completely to marathon training. Going to try to go for it at Philly. Um, I am signed up for Chicago. So I'm going out there next weekend. Um, And I'm not really quite sure how much I'm going to be doing of it. I'm going to probably, so I'm going through a few, few options, either pacing a group of like friends that are trying to hit a time Mm -hmm. or just going all out for the first half and seeing what I can do and where I'm at in my training. And then trusting that I'll stop running after that. I think that's the hardest part for me. (laughs) (laughs) I don't, and I, I know myself and I know that would be difficult for me. So between my coach and I, I have to decide kind of what we're going to do there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then looking ahead to the future, I don't know if I told you this, told you this yet, but um, we did sign up for a half Ironman in That's June awesome. of next year. Which so, one? Uh, Mont Tremblant. Nice. That's yeah, a great I've heard course. it's pretty hilly. <laughs> have you Have you been out there? I not for Ironman. I've been up there for bike racing. Um, but so many of my friends have done Tremblant, both the half and the full, and just consistently people say it's one of their favorite courses. So oh, good. you should have That's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited, very excited for that. Nice. Um, and then 
the, another huge thing over the last um, six months, we opened up uh, our own physical therapy clinic for runners in yes. Hillsborough, New Jersey called Cadence Physical Therapy and Personal Training. Um, so right now I'm the only physical therapist, but we also have six personal trainers that work with us. Nice. Um, and it's been, it's been pretty awesome. I mean, we're growing, it's been an adventure, like figuring out the marketing. I'm sure you understand having like your own practice mm-hmm. as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. Very busy. It's, in a good way. it's so cool following <laughs> your guys on social media and just seeing how you're growing and I love that you're busy and I mean, six personal trainers is a big deal. So congratulations on that. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, And runners in your area are very lucky to have you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Well, I'm excited that you're doing Philly. I'm doing it too, Megan. So hopefully you do we'll Philly too? Yeah, maybe we'll see oh each other goodness. there. I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was going to ask what, what your next race is. Yeah. When yeah, are you we'll getting down to, there? Um, well, I guess we can the, chat. <laughs> yeah, the Friday before. Yeah, <laughs> but we can talk more. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's so exciting to hear your updates. Oh, uh, what shoe did you use for that try where the run was on sand? And was so it a I, good shoe for you? So I went with the Saucony Endorphin Pro 2. Mm-hmm. I don't have the threes, but I really, really like the twos. And I know they do well or better than my usual racing shoes, which I tend to go for the Nike um, Vaporfly 2 or mm-hmm. um, the Alpha Flies. And I, I know those don't do well. I know it was like some sort of a trail. Yeah. So I didn't know it was soft sand because um, then I don't I don't know if I would have made the same choice. But mm-hmm. um, I know they have better traction, in my opinion, than mm-hmm. the Nikes do. Oh, um, so I went with the Endorphin Pro, too. Nice. And you didn't feel like you had any traction issues in those? Um, it was hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, another reason I went with them is because I tried those um, elastic laces for the first time. Mm-hmm. And the next percent twos have like a tongue that like kind of it would be it would still be difficult to get them like perfectly on yeah whereas the endorphin pros have like the um the gusseted tongue so Mm -hmm. it was easier to just slide them on oh yeah i can see that for sure well that's very cool and what a unique (laughs) triathlon course yeah Yeah. (laughs) it was was awesome i mean it was like the swim was great like it was like an out out and back around a buoy and there were only like 20 people that you started with so that Mm -hmm. was like my favorite swim so far, but <laughs> yeah, that's nice to not be in such a big crowd Chaos, at the start. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, move on to the subjective. So, you know, this is a episode today where we're answering your questions. So the subjective is send us more questions. We love to answer your questions. So put them down in the comments, send us an email at doctors of running at gmail.com. So we're going to move into the questions that you all submitted on Instagram. So I'm going to kick the questions off to Megan, and then we will kind of go back and forth on these topics. Um, So the first two questions actually are from Solia underscore A. They have questions about shoes for sprinters. So the first question, Megan, is stiffer or flexible running shoes for sprinters? What do you think? So for sprinters, I would go on the side of stiffer uh, shoes for sprinters. Um, Mostly because so when you're trying to run as fast as they are for a short amount of time, you want that efficiency, that quick energy return. So with a stiffer plate, you're able to get more of that. You're able to get a quicker turnover. Um, I kind of viewed this one as like, like I kind of started thinking of it like on a spectrum of like sprinter to like longer distance. So like maybe 400 down, I would consider like you need like a stiffer plate. And then as you get like into like those longer distances, we'll say 800 at the shortest, it starts like you kind of like start um, the scale starts shifting like, okay, there's more injury risk and issues, discomfort with a stiffer plate versus like, Okay, we want a little bit of um, of the flexibility or cushion as you get into the longer the longer races. But overall, for this one, I'd say long long answer short, um, stiffer. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely agree. And I think you know we often talk about when we're testing shoes like for running faster intervals, and all of us here on DOR are primarily distance runners. I like a shoe that's a little more flexible in the forefoot if I'm doing like mile pace. 
but I'm not doing all out sprints. And I agree if I was doing all out sprints, like training for the 100 or the 200, um, I would want a really stiff shoe, but the longer the event, the, you do need a little more give in your shoe. So, yep, I would agree. Definitely stiffer if we're talking about like the one, the two or the four, um, and then going a little more flexible for anything eight and above. Um, I know this isn't part of this person's question, but just thinking about this question as you go into the even longer distances, though, like half marathon, marathon, a lot of people start preferring a shoe that's a little stiffer to help with efficiency. Like I know that I wouldn't want to run a marathon, let's say, in the streak fly because it's pretty flexible. Um, what what do you think? Like for longer distances for you, half marathon, marathon, are you looking for something that's more flexible, a little stiffer, nice balance of both? Probably a balance of both or toward a little bit stiffer just for that like extra um, bounce or return. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> just for that extra return. Um, but like I'm thinking of the shoes that I usually do like any races or like longer workouts in. And while they do it, like some of them do have the plate, there's a lot of cushion surrounding them, Mm -hmm. which I think obviously that's different than like when I, so when I read this question, I saw like sprinters, I'm picturing them racing in spikes, right? Yeah, (laughs) like the rigid plate underneath. Definitely. I think like, like to your point, um, as the like events get longer and you want more of that energy return efficiency, I think that's where like the plate comes in, but with that added foam between, mm-hmm. so you right. get that little bit of a give too. So it's yep. not as doesn't feel as aggressive as obviously a sprinting shoe. Right. Yeah. Couldn't imagine uh, trying to run very far oh in gosh. a uh, <laughs> sprinting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my calves Spike. are just thinking about that. <laughs> yes. Yes. So the second part of this person's question is um, a comparison of three shoes and. I was surprised at these choices. So it makes me wonder a little bit if this person is talking about like 100, 200 meter sprinting or maybe just strides. But between these three shoes, which would you pick for sprinting? The New Balance Propel version four, New Balance SC Trainer version two, or New Balance Rebel version three? Mm. So this is a really tough one for me because I haven't run in any of them. So yeah. <laughs> um, it makes it a little a little difficult. But I did read a little bit through and I actually saw these both as like separate questions. So mm-hmm. I felt like in general for training, which if we go on the training side, just based off what I've read and like reviews and everything, I, I personally would choose the V4 because it sounds a lot like to me, it sounds a lot like the endorphin speed, which I love to run in. Um, has the less aggressive plate. Uh, I believe the V2 has the carbon uh, carbon plate in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so in my, in my opinion, I would have gone with the V4 just thinking of regular training. For sprinting, what's... Do you remember off the top of your head with the like stack height? I'm thinking stack height for sprinters because you want that like yeah. ground feel too. Do you so remember? Here's, there we go. Here's the SC Trainer version two. So really thick sole, uh, forty at least forty in the heel. Um, I would not sprint in this. It's mm-hmm. just it's too much shoe. The Rebel V3. That it would actually be my pick. I didn't. The Rebel didn't work too well for me just because of where the toe spring starts. Um, But this would be a good sprinting shoe out of the three just because it's this is not a super low stack height shoe, but it feels like one. I if I remember right, the stacks like in the 30s, Um, but it still has a fair amount of ground feel to it, despite the thicker midsole. And it's pretty flexible in the forefoot. Um, The Propel is the only one I haven't run in, but. I would agree with you from just reading the reviews. You could sprint in that one. Um, So I would say between the Propel and the Rebel, definitely not the SC Trainer version one or version two, although version two would be more suited to faster running than version one because version two has lost some weight. The midsole isn't, the stack height isn't quite as thick as version one. All right, so the next question comes from Andre Palma, 
And that person wants to know best ways to find the right shoe for you. Do you go by cheapest or the most expensive? This this is an interesting one. Yeah. So I think for I I think the best way to find the right shoe for you is to try a bunch of, to try different ones. Go to like your local running store, see what fit, feels right on your foot. Um, some stores are like okay with you taking them for like a short test run to try it out. Um, to go cheapest versus expensive. I mean, there are a lot of very expensive shoes out there that do not work for everybody and vice versa. There are some like, I don't even want to say cheaper shoes, but less expensive shoes that are out there that might be perfect for you versus like a $275, $300 pair of shoe out there. Like going based off price, I think that's more difficult of... I don't know. It's that's a, a difficult uh, thing to put as like one of the first, the first things to look at when choosing the right shoe. I would think more of like like get that like gait analysis, test out the shoes, see what kind of a foot you have, what fits what fits better, any injury history, anything like that. What do you, what do you think? I totally agree. I think price is not indicative of how a shoe is going to perform for an individual. I mean, these days, price is indic- indicative of the type of shoe you're getting. If you're looking at a shoe over $200, you're probably getting a shoe that has P-backs. You're probably getting a shoe that has at least a nylon plate, if not a carbon plate. So it's a shoe that's designed for racing. Um, m- most like decent trainers these days are in the $130 to $150 range. But there are plenty of trainers in like the $90 to $100 range that perform just as well, if not better. And the only way to know is to test them out. So I definitely wouldn't use price as a way to, as the primary means of choosing your shoe. You've definitely got to go try them out. And remember, all of these shoes go on sale and some of them go on sale really quickly. So if there's an expensive shoe that you've tried at the running store and you really love it, but it's just too much for you, wait three months because it very well could be 30% off or even more. Yeah. And I know there, there are also um, like some websites have like comparison tools. Mm -hmm. So like, say you try on a pair of shoes that, oh my gosh, they're perfect. They're so comfortable, but I can't afford them. You can see like, okay, what shoe is similar to it test that one out and see if that works like if if price really is a a limiting factor then that's another another thing to to try look at definitely and the other thing i would say is you could have three shoes that are the same price one of them you could get 500 miles out of one you could get 200 miles out of and one you could get 300 out of so durability also factors into like the the value of a shoe So that's where reading shoe reviews and especially like the longer term shoe reviews. That's why at DOR, we try to publish like 100 mile updates, 200 mile updates, 300 mile updates. So people know how these shoes perform over time. Lots of shoes are going to feel great after 30 miles. But if at 200 miles, you've completely chewed through the exposed midsole and you can't run in it anymore, that shoe isn't a very good value. Whereas if you had a shoe that the, was the same price and you could get three or 400 miles out of it, well, you've essentially made that shoe half as expensive for you compared to buying that shoe that wears out at 200. Yeah. Um, all right. So next question comes from PEJ underscore 2018. And I, this is a great question. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts, <laughs> Megan. So, Stability shoes for neutral runners or only neutral shoes for neutral runners? So I would go toward neutral shoes for neutral runners because stability shoes end up doing a lot of the work for, I think they have a a time and a place for stability shoes, obviously, Um, but they do a lot of the work for the smaller muscles in your foot and ankle. So if you're already like, if you're already a neutral runner, why are we going to give that support to muscles that already are kind of figuring out how to do their job that you're not having any issues with. Um, I think if you throw a stability shoe at a neutral runner, that might actually end up leading to more weaknesses down the line. Whereas like a neutral shoe gives more of that, um, 
ability or opportunity for those muscles to perform for those smaller muscles to work and support the archer on their own instead of having that stability shoe control um, any movement. So for this one, I would definitely go toward a neutral shoe. Yeah, and I would agree with what you said. And I would also say that, you know, back in the day when you talked about a stability shoe, you were talking about a shoe with a medial post. Um, but now stability has really been expanded in terms of what type of stability you can provide. So if you're a very neutral runner and you run in, let's say, a traditional stability shoe with a medial post, not only could that potentially weaken the muscles in your feet, but it could also push you too far laterally and give you an injury. So a stability shoe for a person who doesn't need to avoid excess medial motion can actually be detrimental to the runner. So similar, like for me, I, t I have the opposite problem. I often land too far laterally. So if I ran in a shoe that tried to prevent or control pronation at all, it tends to give me pain at my lateral midfoot because it's essentially keeping me even further out for longer, which is a problem I have even without a stability shoe. Mm -hmm. However, that being said, there are some neutral runners who their favorite shoe in the world is a stability shoe. So if you're comfortable in that shoe... There's absolutely nothing wrong with using that. You know, we talk about a lot about the comfort filter, um, which basically states that a shoe that is comfortable for a runner is most likely to be the right shoe for a runner. So if you're a, you know, neutral runner out there, but your favorite shoe is a traditional stability shoe, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to stop running in it. But you also might consider adding in a shoe that has less most motion control elements and see how what effect that has on your running and your mechanics. Yes, and also like 100% agree with that. If if you found a shoe that's comfortable and works for you and you're not getting injured, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but maybe like as the PT and me wants to uh, come out and say, make sure you're doing like your foot and ankle exercises, keeping those muscles working, like all that. But that goes for every runner out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The next question is from Angie Runs. Um, foam rolling or massage gun, Megan? Um, I would go toward, mas uh, sorry, Oof. I would go toward the foam rolling, not massage gun. Um, uh -huh. I don't have anything against massage guns personally. Um, but I find the foam roller to be, um, more effective and more, um, controlled, I guess. Um, I think I, I like it because you can start more with like a broad, um, like a broad area and then find those like focal points that you want to spend a little bit more time on with the foam roller. Whereas with the Theragun or the massage gun or, um, whatever brand you have, um, I, I find like I, I tend to either miss spots or I focus too much on one spot to the point that it actually is counterproductive. Um, but I would say for this one, foam rolling. I would say both, um, but if I had to only use one or only recommend one to somebody, I would recommend using a foam roller because I think that it is more effective overall at improving fascial mobility and decreasing soreness. But I use both, and I use them for different purposes. So I use the foam roller to roll out. Like when, I, when my muscles feel tight or sore, I've done a hard workout, or I sat on a plane for five hours, the foam roller definitely works better at making me feel like I can move better. The massage gun really works at a neuromuscular, neuromuscular level to help your muscles relax. And I actually primarily use my massage gun before I run as kind of like not an activation tool because the whole premise of activation is a little uh, dubious, but it feels like it just prepares me to run. Um, I spend a couple minutes on each major muscle group in my legs and I feel ready to move after that. Um, but if I had to only use one tool, it would definitely be the foam roller. So, uh, question, I have a question for you. <laughs> so yeah. would you, do you use uh, the foam roller ever before or you just do like the massage gun before and then, uh, foam roller after? Yeah. Foam roller after. 
I've, I've experimented with all sorts of stuff over the years. Um, and I just, I find that if I foam roll before I run, it's almost too much. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of like getting a deep tissue massage the day before a workout or a race and like your legs feel dead afterwards. I kind of yeah. feel that way if I foam roll before running. Um, okay. It's just, it's too much pressure on my fascia and muscles right before needing to perform. So for me, it works better afterwards. I'm going to try that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Report back, please. I will. I will. <laughs> And uh, this actually brings us nicely into our next question from Chai Bree Nine: um, Massage post marathon or no? And if yes, best time. So, for me, the thought of getting a massage the day after a marathon sounds horrible. Yes. <laughs> um, I, that being said, as a PT, I've given massages the day after somebody are in a marathon, and they swear by it. But for me, I would say. Probably not until three days after, <laughs> um, just because I I don't think I I don't think I would respond well to um, having anyone work on my legs right after a marathon. Yeah, <laughs> like just like like I'd go back to like the previous question. I'd rather take a foam roller where it's something that I'm in control of. Like I'm not saying don't do any mobility or any like recovery work, but. I would say more of something that you're able to control the amount of pressure, you know what you're feeling and can control it. Um, like just some light foam rolling mobility until that like third day when you're, when you're feeling better. Yeah, I would agree. I, I'm, you know, this question assumes that like you can't get a massage multiple times a week, but, um, I think if let's say you're getting one 60 to 90 minute massage in the week after the marathon, I think waiting at least two or three days makes the most sense because then the massage therapist will be able to do some deeper work on your legs. If you were to get a massage like the day after or even the second day after, the massage therapist would probably just have to stick to gentler techniques um, to help with relaxation, to help get any swelling out, maybe do some lymphatic type work. But most people probably aren't going to tolerate deep tissue work one to two days afterwards. Uh, personally, I like to get a massage like either the second or the third day after the marathon. Um, I will be on my foam roller the day of the marathon, actually, uh, and my massage gun, because I know that even though it might feel uncomfortable when I start, it's going to feel better when it's done. Uh, coming back to running from cycling, I've just been struck how differently the body responds to like a hard bike race versus a hard running race um, and how important movement is after a marathon or even a half marathon or a shorter race. Whereas after a bike race, you just kind of feel like laying around and like walking really doesn't make you feel better. But after a marathon, if you don't walk, you're going to be a crumpled ball of yes. pain very quickly. So it's almost <laughs> it's almost like subconsciously you know that too because yep. the last thing I want to do is sit down or like not move for an extended period of time right after a marathon. Like oh, yeah. sitting down for lunch and then like or whatever meal after the marathon and then standing back up. You're like, "Oh no. <laughs> we got to keep moving." <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, I did grandma's in June. My friend and I did it together and we flew back from Minnesota the day after. And my friend is also a PT. So we're at the airport and she's like, I think we should take the stairs. And we had to go down, you know, the giant flight of stairs at the airport. And I was like, all right. And we're carrying our carry-ons and we're struggling. And there's this little girl at the bottom of the stairs looking at us like, what is wrong with these two ladies? <laughs> Those are the, that's the time when you have to wear the race shirt, the exactly. medal. So everyone's like, oh, okay, you just yeah. ran a marathon. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Not like call 911 for these yeah. poor people. Are they okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll be okay. Don't worry. <laughs> it was a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So let's move on to the next question, which is a really good question. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking about the lack thereof of research on this topic. So Jen Chavarro asked cryotherapy versus red light therapy. So Megan, could you tell us a little bit about what both of those terms mean 
And if you were going to pick one of them as a runner, which one would you choose? So I haven't actually done either of these. I'm not big on like these kinds of um, like recovery techniques where, but I do think they have like a time and place. I think this is just more of like a side note, I guess, but um, there's a lot of like recovery techniques and tools out there that work for some people and work wonders, but don't do anything for other people. So I think if you're looking for a new recovery technique, these are good ones to try. Um, so cryotherapy is basically, um, like a quick, I think it's usually two and a half minutes of freezing, freezing cold environment. Um, I was talking to one of my clients before I said, it's like you walk into this chamber and it's extremely cold and you stand there for two and a half minutes and then you come out and usually feel well, besides cold, you feel great <laughs> after. Um, whereas like red light therapy, um, I don't know if you want to expand on this a little bit more, Andrea, but it sounds like it's more of it uses certain um, like waves and frequencies to a specific area of your body to promote more blood flow and more of like the um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, more of the cells that you want to repair the tissue. Um, so it sounds like cryotherapy is more of like a broad recovery, like general whole body recovery um, technique, whereas the red light therapy is more focused and helps with recovery toward the next session. Would, yeah. Would yeah. You yeah. Add to I, I would agree with everything yeah. you said. Um, yeah. Cryotherapy being an extreme, an extremely cold environment produces whole body and localized effects. So of course, one of the main things that's going to happen is vasoconstriction, right? And that's why we put ice packs on people. So after like a hard workout, um, actually there are different sex differences in how your body responds to a workout, but it can be helpful to create an environment where the blood vessels in your legs constrict to help push blood flow back to your core and then when you come out of that cold environment, your blood vessels dilate or widen, bringing blood flow back to the area. And during that time of vasoconstriction, all of those metabolites of your hard workout, inflammatory chemicals, uh, maybe some muscle breakdown, those concentrate at the capillary border. And then as you vasodilate, your blood basically washes all of that away, brings it back, your kidneys process it, and you get rid of it. Um, so cryotherapy is thought to do all of that. Um, but in terms of what it actually does for athletes depends on what your goal is. So like if you're strength training and you're trying to get hypertrophy benefits or you're trying to get... Um, all of the inflammatory benefits of having overloaded your muscles, cryotherapy is actually not a great thing to do um, because we all know that the way we get stronger is by breaking down so that you can build up. But if you blunt that inflammatory response, you're not going to get as big of a building up response. So doing cryotherapy after a big workout in the gym might not be the best choice. Um, there is limited evidence for cryotherapy for endurance athletes. Um, but kind of the consensus on both of these treatments is there's not enough research to really say, and there's not enough research to really say what the best protocol is. Um, specifically to Jen Chavara's question, like if you had to pick between one of these two. I actually found a study that compared the two trials. So they looked at, they did a overview of um, articles that compared cryotherapy and red light therapy. And they only found five trials. Um, two of them were in rats. So again, there's really limited evidence. Um, the study is called The Effectiveness of Photobiomodulation Therapy versus Cryotherapy for Skeletal Muscle Recovery, Critically Appraised to Topic. We will put the link in the show notes. Um, this was in uh, Journal of Sport Rehab in 2017. And basically, they found that, um, let me just scroll through here. So they recommend 
the light therapy over cryotherapy for post-exercise muscle recovery. But they did emphasize that the number of studies and the quality of the studies were not high. So really more research is needed. Um, My view about recovery modalities like this is a lot of these recovery modalities use the placebo effect to make their differences. So if you feel better after you go into a cold chamber, after you do a hard long run or a hard workout, then you should keep doing it. But if you don't do cryotherapy currently, are you missing out on some giant performance benefit by starting to go? Maybe, maybe not. And these places aren't cheap either. Um, the other thing that I would point out, I don't know about where you live, Megan, but there are all of these like recovery centers cropping up and there aren't any medical people there. There, you know, it's usually staffed by like one person who definitely is not a healthcare practitioner and you can get hurt if the settings in a cryotherapy chamber are incorrect or even if a red light therapy Uh, board is not set correctly. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to try modalities like this, I would highly recommend using them in a place that is run and staffed by healthcare practitioners. A lot of PT clinics have these modalities. So I would look for a place like that if you're going to try them. Don't go to some, you know, fly by night operation that looks shiny from the outside, but the staff on the inside doesn't really know what they're doing. Yeah, a hundred percent agree with that. There are a lot popping up <clears throat> all over the place. Honestly, we just had one open up like probably five minutes down the street from us, um, and I kind of want to go there check it out just so I know like if it's a trustworthy site or if I can send people there if they're looking for new re- recovery uh, or to try new recovery modalities. Um, another thing so with this question that I was thinking is the timing of it with your workouts. Mm -hmm. So I know like back in college, we used to all take ice baths after these workouts and we do like a hard interval workout, jump in the ice bath. And then later on, like probably like halfway through college, I found, I started learning about like physiology and, um, the effects of ice on recovery and how it actually stops that inflammatory process that you want, that it's the first right. step of rebuilding that tissue. So I wouldn't say like, based on that, I wouldn't say like jump into a cryotherapy chamber or even into an ice bath immediately after a hard workout or even the day of like, maybe wait until like an easy day a recovery day where you're not stressing your body that much. You've already began that recovery process and are well into it. Um, that I think would be, if it does have an effect on you, that would be the optimal time. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, That's why, like, you'll notice in, like, recovery shakes or um, even, like, during exercise hydration options, you're not seeing antioxidants included on the ingredient list, like, maybe five or ten years ago. And that's because these companies have figured out that inflammation is actually good. Like, we want to create inflammation because that's how we get stronger. Now, it's different if you're talking about like a multi-day event, like the Tour de France, then yeah, you do want to blunt inflammation immediately after you finish because you've got to perform the next day and the next day for 21 more days. So if you're doing some sort of like multi-day running race, then you might consider using modalities that decrease inflammation. Um, But even after a marathon, like, The marathon just created a whole ton of really worthwhile inflammation. Why would you blunt that? Because all of that is what's going to make you fitter for your next marathon. So, and of course, that's like a whole nother topic, like (laughs) what to do immediately after your marathon, which maybe we should do that topic, Megan. Get a Um, big meal. (laughs) Yes. Big meal. Maybe, Maybe don't get drunk. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nice burger. That's my go-to. But oh anyway. <laughs> yeah, oh burger and fries after a marathon are just about the best, best thing. Yes, the best. <laughs> yep. Uh, I just want to say one more quick thing about cryotherapy before we move on. Um, there are differences in how women and men respond to 
cryotherapy, cold water immersion. So women are more sensitive to cold. We start shivering at a higher temperature than men. We feel colder sooner and less comfortable than men during the same cooling protocol. So it may be that if you are going to use a cryotherapy center or you're going to do cold water immersion, you want to do it at a slightly warmer temperature than what would be used for men. But that also depends on researchers really dialing in, well, what are the right protocols for male endurance athletes and female endurance athletes? And we're just not there yet. Um, but women, because we women actually tend to vasodilate after exercise, where men actually do get some vasoconstriction, women actually can benefit more from cold immersion because that vasoconstriction from the cold helps us return that blood to our core. Stacy Sims has a lot of good stuff to say about this if you want to check out her blog. Um, I You follow her, right? Yeah. 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 Very helpful uh, helping women kind of figure out what is the best approach for them. All right. So let's move on. So Josh James Co. has a question about 10K racing shoes. So would you choose Takumi Sen, SC Pacer, or the Vaporfly for 10K? Vaporfly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would always choose the Vapor Flies are my favorite racing shoes. <laughs> yes, mine too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the Vapor Fly Three. I mean, it. I would wear the shoe for a mile, and I've worn it yeah. for a marathon. Like you can oh, use yeah. it for anything. Yeah, yeah. I love the Vapor Flies. The SC Pacer. I love this shoe for workouts, but it just doesn't have the same snap as the Vapor Fly for races. Although M. Sisson apparently has run her past at least two marathons in the Pacer. So that's pretty interesting. I, I don't know if she's running in the one that I have here or if she has her own special one. But yeah, she runs in the Pacer, which is pretty interesting. I mean, and imagine they're probably made especially for her. She's I think an American so. American record holder. Yeah, yeah. They might have a <laughs> slightly different midsole material or... Uh, different type of plate but who are we to know <laughs> i have run in the takumi sentence for a workout um i had i just had some problem some difficulty with um the, getting the right heel lock on those mm, yeah that i couldn't it was either like way too tight or way too loose so it took me like a few times to get it just right but the vapor flies never have never failed me <laughs> no me either i've never run the takumi sun i would definitely like to test it um, but yeah, the vapor fly, it, it really can do anything. It's when you think about some of these super shoes that are, you know, more expensive than the vapor fly 290. Now you've got the new Adidas, uh, Evo pro one that just broke the women's world record this weekend to 11, uh, $500. <laughs> I mean, the vapor flies, I don't want to say this because I don't want Nike to raise their prices. Not that they're listening to our podcast. Maybe they are. <laughs> but 250 for the vapor fly is a steal, especially with its longevity. I've got, I think, 125 miles on my pair, and they're still in great shape. Yeah, same. Mine, I've been using, I've, I've raced in them multiple times, workouts, and they're still like, they still have a similar pop to like when I first started running in them oh yeah yeah and the outsole has lasted really nicely um yeah they know what they're doing for sure <laughs> <laughs> all right another shoe comparison this time for a 5k cross-country race from apple saw theater <laughs> um so saucony sinister or nike streak fly for a 5k xc mm. I haven't run in the Saucony Sinisters. I've run in the Streak Flies a few times, and I liked them. I think for cross country, if we're going with a regular shoe with um, like a plate in there, I think the Streak Flies have they don't have the carbon plate in there, so I think that's better for a cross country race, um, just because it gives you a little bit more of that. Um, that's what I'm looking for. Um, 
not stiffness <laughs> um adapts it, it adapts better to the surface mm-hmm. that you're on um and it's very light so i would say i guess i'd say more of the streak fly i don't know i haven't tried the sinister though so so i have both shoes Where'd I put? okay here's the sinister i have this shoe i could barely walk around in it I asked for the men's version because I knew that the shoe would be narrow in the toe box. And it's so narrow and low volume in the toe box, I couldn't run, you know, five steps in it. So if you have a narrow foot, this could be a really great shoe for you. Just looking at the outsole, it's got kind of a, it's got a pretty good tread. It almost reminds me of the Reebok Float Ride Adventures tread, which is a really nice light trail shoe. So this could work really well for a XC race. Um, this is much stiffer. You can see the forefoot has some give to it, but the mid and rear foot is very stiff. So if you're looking for a stiffer XC shoe and you have a very narrow foot, the Sinister could be a good option. Now, the Streak Fly, I love this shoe. I have put a lot of miles on it, as you can see. Um, this shoe feels like a slipper. It has really good ground feel. I would guess a lot better than the Sinister, just based on the nature of the outsole. Um, I would probably run a cross-country race in it. Similar to the Vapor Fly, just really nice upper, fits nicely. No irritation of my foot whatsoever. Um, and it's just got the right balance with that p shank, um, and the Zumex midsole. So you, it's got some flexibility. You can feel the ground, but it's super light, so you can still run fast in it. So I would personally choose the Streak Fly both for its fit and for its midsole characteristics, the fact that there's more ground feel and better flexibility. But if you have a narrow foot and you like a stiffer XC shoe, the Sinister might be great. Uh, but you need to have a really narrow foot for this to fit. So be warned. Um, <laughs> pretty sure this shoe is on sale. So if you want to try it and you think it'll fit you, I think you can get a good deal on it. Um, I was really bummed that the shoe didn't work for me because I think I would really like it if it fit my foot. If you were going to run an XC race, Megan, what would be your top choice? Um, outside of these two? Yeah. Um, Dragonfly XC. Yeah. I yeah, would love, those, I, have, yeah. I want to try that shoe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all, so I also, I coach at, um, well, uh, high school at Somerville High School in New Jersey mm-hmm. and all the, all the kids have the Dragonfly XC shoes. They look awesome. I mean, I've, I've raced in the regular track shoes mm-hmm. and they're my favorite spikes by far. So yeah. I can't imagine the cross country ones being much different. Right. <laughs> um, so I would a hundred percent choose the Dragonfly XCs. Yeah. Nice. What about you? Um, well, pro- I would probably buy a pair of those, um, yeah. <laughs> out of the shoes that I own. I don't know. I'd probably use the vapor fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah why not yeah i'm sure they'd be good there too <laughs> yeah i because the vapor fly for me has very good traction like in dirt or on wet roads um yeah that would i would go with the vapor fly for sure yep <laughs> <laughs> it's the do-it-all shoe best value in running all right so we're going to move on to some fueling questions so zanti monty asks Easy long run with complete fueling strategy or easy long run with less to no fueling? So this one is a definite complete fueling strategy uh, for me. It seemed like a very obvious choice for me. I've run long, plenty of long runs under fueled and it is not a good feeling. Um, get cramps all over the place. You have to work harder. Like it, the paces feel harder. Um, I a hundred percent say with a fueling strategy, bring, I bring t- a couple, even if it's like bringing one, one gel with you on the run. Um, no, it's definitely, definitely a complete fueling strategy it makes a huge difference. Totally agree. And especially for women, um, uh, women definitely perform best in a fueled state. 
Um, the idea of doing a fasted, easy workout for a female does not work as well as it can for a male. Males can benefit from shorter fasted training runs. Um, but women, because we have a different cortisol response, we actually get a detriment if we train fasted. So I don't, again, I don't know who Zanti Monty is, but, um, if you're a female, definitely not. If you're a male, I would maybe consider doing your shorter, easy runs in a fasted state, not all of them, but some, especially if your goal is to improve your ability to burn fat. But for females, every run's got to be fueled. All right. Uh, next question. Very controver controversial questions that we've got here. KDF55 wants to know liquid <laughs> or gel fuel? So I think it depends <laughs> for this one. Um, I typically go gel fuel because I'll have, I know when and where I'll be getting water with it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going out on a long training run for a marathon and you're bringing just gels, but you don't know if you're going to have water, I'd say go more on the liquid route. Um, I know there are some liquid, I don't want to call them liquid gels, but like um, Power Gel has, um, it's Power Gel Hydro, and it's actually in the form of a liquid in a gel pouch. So the whole point of it is that you have enough liquid in there that you don't need water with it, and your body can still absorb everything. Um that being said, for races, you're typically going to have um, you're going to have water stations in most big races, most half marathons, marathons, even down to some 10Ks, 5Ks. Um, so you'll have that water option. So you might even want to think about like training with both and seeing like, okay, if I take a gel around when the water station is, then I, I can actually I, I can actually get the benefits of this because. Sometimes the gels are easier to take. They're quicker. So you can get them done and then just get back to locking in on a pace wherever you're settling in. Um, whereas with a liquid, if you're carrying a bottle or anything, it might be a little bit, um, I don't know, it might change your form. It might be a little more uncomfortable. So if I had to choose one, well, first I'd say both. If I had to choose one, <laughs> um, I would go with the gel. Yeah, I I agree. One, you have to whatever you're going to choose, you have to practice with so that you're you know it works for you on race day. Personally, I go with gels. What you're talking about with the Powerade gels are called isotonic gels, where the the concentration of glucose, fructose, electrolytes is similar to that in your bloodstream so that you don't need to take water with it to improve absorption. Um, some people have no problem carrying a handheld bottle while they're running or racing. So if that's you and it's easier for you to have like, let's say Morton 360 in your bottle or like the scratch high carb or something similar, and you aren't good at taking gels, then drinking that can be a good way to get your carbs in without having to carry or swallow so many gels. Um, so I think it just depends what works best for you, but whatever you decide, you need to practice in the months leading up to your goal race. And then on a similar note, ER Day asks, berry or dessert coffee flavored <laughs> gels, obviously the most important debate of them all so what do you say megan i go berry 100 percent. my <laughs> so quick story so my first long run training for my first marathon i brought a my first gel with me and it was a chocolate fudge and i ever since then i don't think i could ever go to a dessert flavor gel um i i almost i stopped my long run i was like you know what Maybe, maybe marathons are just not for me. <laughs> I, I felt so nauseous. I don't think the sweet, um, like the sweeter ones, like mm -hmm. dessert flavored are uh, for me. So 100% berry, always berry. <laughs> I definitely like berry, but I also like the coffee flavored ones. I don't like chocolate gels because nothing actually tastes like chocolate and it is too sweet. But I actually alternate between berry liquid shot coffee liquid shot and morton during a marathon so i kind of i get a nice balance of you know, berry <laughs> coffee and no flavor yeah yeah 
<laughs> so our answer is berry or both. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Another controversial question from Mol- Moltizan tracksuit. Um, out or back or loop? So I get bored very easily if I do the same thing over and over again. Um, I would prefer loop probably for most of my, all of my easy runs. I'd say a loop. Um, Sometimes for like a tempo or progression run, I do like an out and back just for like that mental component. And it's more of a controlled course. Um, Like I'm picturing like I have a towpath nearby um, that I like to use for a lot of either tempos or progressive, progressive long runs. So, you know, once you get to that turnaround point, okay, now we're on, we're on our way home. Like we're on our way back. I think that does help. And whatever Hills you hit on the way out, you're going to get them on the way back and vice versa. So it makes it like more of a fair workout course. But, um, most of the time, if, if I find a loop that works really well for a tempo, I'm, I'm for sure going to choose the loop versus an out and back. Oh yeah, I agree. Loop all the way. Only time I do out and back is if I'm doing like a really controlled workout where I need mm-hmm. to know what the, the route's going to be like. Um, and it's cool to see what your loop looks like on Strava afterwards if you got yeah. like a bonus Strava art that you didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we like to look back at, um, at like any new loops that we make or like if we decide to like explore on an easy run and like name this new new loop now based uh-huh. off whatever shape we make or wh- whatever we see in the shape. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I was bike racing, one of my uh, interval loops, if I was doing like 10 minute hill climb intervals, ended up looking like an axe, which I thought was perfect for the type of workout I was doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Fox in socks in box with Knox asks... <laughs> Shorts or half tights? Ah, <laughs> uh, shorts. I like, shorts. Um, well, I like half tights that are very short. I like, you know, like boy shorts. So I'm not sure if that was one of the options, but. Yeah, I'd say for shorts, I'd say f- probably like, I don't know, they measure like the inseam. I'd say like four inches or yeah, or less, but enough to store gels in the side. Yes. Pockets. Yeah. That's important. The rabbit the the leggy 2.5 inch and the four inch with the pockets are my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, uh, is that like the, the speed leggy? Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what yeah. I used yesterday on my long run. Yeah. Those are <laughs> awesome, great. aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love them. <laughs> All right. EK Friesen 87 wants to know easy run when you have a cold or no? Um, So for me, I guess it depends on the severity of the cold. Mm -hmm. If you're like super congested, have a hard time breathing, like just doing your daily stuff, um, I'd say probably no run. But for me, sometimes if it's like, yeah, I'm a little like congested, I feel a little off. Sometimes a run helps clear, um, clear it up a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, That being said, like I would, I wouldn't attempt a workout on that day or a harder run. I'd say more of like a shorter, easy run, like just... Sometimes even just being outside yeah. helps helps uh, helps feel better. But if you if you're questioning it and you're like, oh, I don't know if I should run, I don't know. Um, chances are you probably shouldn't, <laughs> right? Because um, it could also delay that heal that not healing that um, uh, recovering and like get, bouncing back from whatever uh, whatever your body's fighting. Because then it's your body's already working to get you back to back to normal, back to 100%. And then if you throw a hard run at it when it's not um, in the right state to do that, it could end up actually prolonging that that illness, that sickness, cold, um, a little bit longer than it otherwise would have. Whereas a day off, you might be fine the next day or yep. two days later instead of like forcing a run. Um, but there are definitely times that I've gone out there a little sniffly that I feel better after a run, but I wouldn't, yep. I wouldn't go out there if I had like – a fever, cough, anything like that. Yeah, totally agree. Um, also, it doesn't have to be a run. Maybe just go for a walk. Like, just get outside and get moving without getting your heart rate up. And that can help you feel a little better, too. 
So our last two questions are from a very special listener, Bach, our social media <laughs> wizard. Um, Bach has a question for Megan, and Bach has a question for me. So Bach's question for Megan is, stride or cadence? Why is your clinic named cadence? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously I have to choose cadence, so my shirt says cadence too. Yep. So um, <laughs> um, It's not only my clinic name, but... Um, <laughs> um, so... I'll, I'll explain why the clinic has named Caden. So it's been like a, a dream of mine for a while to open up a PT clinic for, for runners specifically. Um, it was like a five-year goal, but everything just kind of fell into place. But my partner and I had already created an Instagram before Cadence, the actual physical therapy clinic, was born um, because it applied to, for a few reasons, it applied to all three disciplines of triathlons, which both of us, he does um, triathlons and everything's done uh, half fireman um but we were like okay this word applies to um swimming for your strokes per minute um biking for revolutions per minute and running steps per minute so we're like okay that's something that can apply we can take it to all three which is where the three circles of cadence came in um which they all like overlap uh and then the word cadence means repetition, consistency, which is what you need to reach your goals ultimately. Um, now outside of that, if I want to go, if I would take this question to like, say we're doing a gait analysis, if I want to like stride or cadence, I know a lot, a lot of times, a lot of issues with mechanics in your gait, um, can be resolved with a change in your cadence. So say you're overstriding, let's try to increase your cadence. That's going to promote like a quicker turnover is going to promote your promote you to get your feet down faster instead of like taking those long, uh, long strides, spending a lot of time up in the air. Um, it also helps um, helps to correct like any like for vertical oscillation it helps decrease that. Um, but yeah, I, I would go cadence, obviously. <laughs> Love it. Have to. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I actually didn't know why you. I mean, I had an idea why you named it Cadence, but I, I love it. And yeah, congrats again on so, your clinic. It's thank so you. cool. Yeah, we had actually started the Instagram for like our triathlon uh, ventures and like biking and uh -huh. and all that. And then when everything kind of fell and started like falling into place, like oh wow, we're gonna do this right now. We're doing this. That's um, awesome. We switched it over, obviously, to. Uh, physical therapy and uh, running specifically. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. All right. And uh, box question to me, which, you know, we really can't get through an episode without talking about the New Balance Beacon. So, <laughs> ba and this is an important question. Bach wants to know if I would choose the New Balance Beacon V3 or the Brooks Hyperion Max. And for those who don't know, I don't know who doesn't know who listens to this <laughs> podcast, but I am on a campaign to save the beacon, which New Balance has discontinued because it is the greatest shoe ever made. That being said, since the Brooks Hyperion Max actually exists and is available for purchase, I choose it. Um, thank you, Brooks, for making that shoe. And the other reason I choose it is the Hyperion Max is much, much more durable than the beacon was. I was lucky to get 200 miles out of the beacon because there was so much exposed midsole. Hyperion Max, I'm on my second pair of Hyperion Maxes with 300 miles on them and they're still going strong. So while I still would like New Balance to bring the beacon back, please, New Balance, <laughs> do it. Um, maybe when you bring it back, you can give it a little more rubber outsole coverage. Uh, but until then, I choose the Hyperion Max. <laughs> Notice she said, when you bring it back. That's right. And I, I know you will. You'll do the right thing eventually. <laughs> Listen to the people. <laughs> well, Megan, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for joining me for This or That Volume 1. Um, maybe we can uh, get back on later in the year and talk about Philly and how all that went and at what point we got our post-marathon massages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how much we screamed. <laughs> but until then, um, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, leave us a comment down below. Shoot us an email at doctorsofrunning at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time.